Praise the Lord, everybody. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, or this evening rather, let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him for this opportunity. Hallelujah. I am glad to be here. There's an old song that says, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. It's never going to lose its power. And I thought about that today, and I thought, Brother Terrence, about going through situations as pastor preached and trials and tribulations, and it seems like the devil wants to make you think that it's over with. You're going to die in your failures. You're going to die in your mistakes. But I'm here to tell you that in the middle of those things, when we realize the blood never loses its power, we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Amen. And I'm thankful that he never gave up on me and he's never give up on you because you're in the house tonight. So one more time, let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him like we mean it for his mercy, his goodness, and his grace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. I am glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. If we have any prayer requests, we're going to do it different tonight. If you got any prayer requests, just let them be made known by the raising of your hand. The Lord knows each and every one of them. I know there's a lot here tonight, a lot of sickness going on. But I know God is a healer, amen? The flu bug, it might, might have a lot of people down and out. But I know God is able to take care of that as well. So let's go before him tonight, if you don't mind. Lord, we love you. We thank you for every promise, Lord. We know that every promise in the book is ours, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, we give you honor, and we magnify you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you, God, for every need that we have because we can bring them to you. Lord, we can make our petitions known unto you, Lord, and we know you're going to take care of them. God, you said, call upon me in the day of trouble, and you would deliver us. We're calling upon you tonight, God, asking and faith believing that you touch every need, no matter how small, no matter how large, whatever the need may be. God, from the, from the financial to cancer, Lord, whatever it might be and everything in between, we pray that you touch those needs, that you strengthen, that you encourage, and that you bless. God, that we've come here tonight to magnify you, to praise you, and to bless your name because you are worthy, Lord, of our praise. And we thank you, and we magnify your name and your voice in this place tonight. And we give you honor and we give you praise in the name that is above every name, the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And the church said, amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise and thank him tonight. Let's do 
Thank you, Jesus. You may see, be seated just for a moment tonight. I sent something to Brother Shannon the other night, a couple other fellas. That Brother Victor Jackson had sent, and I had read it a while back. But it says perfectionism is the enemy of of obedience stop delaying what God wants you to do because you would like to do his will perfectly delay can become denial get to work lean on God and he will help you you have what it takes right now right now Brother Blake, when we repent of our sins and we're filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, we've got everything we need to be a walking, talking, living epistle of God. To be an example the way he was an example. We've got it from day one. And the best thing we can do, and I've mentioned it before, is literally tell what God has done for us. Brother Ronnie, when we do that, we're doing exactly what God tells us to do. When I explain to you what God has done for me and let you know, sister friend, that if he done it for me, he can do it for you. And if he done it for you, he can do it for somebody else. When we get that realization that it's not that hard just to tell somebody, hey, look what God has done for me. And if he did it for me, I can do it for you. I ain't perfect and I'm never going to be perfect. But the one I serve is perfect. Amen. And he's able to do all things. And I put my faith my hope and my trust in him because he's going to lead me and he's going to guide me and I'm going to follow him all of my days. Amen. The Bible says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's my prayer. Amen. Amen. The psalmist wrote, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes and I shall keep them unto the end. That's my prayer. That's my desire. God, help me to keep your word until the end, Brother Johnny, to keep on getting it. To keep on fighting, no matter how hard the trial may be, no matter how rough it might be, no matter how many times we fail or falter. Pastor told us Sunday, you might be right smack dab in the middle of your mess, but God is proving us. God is making us, and pretty soon if we keep on going the way we know, keep on being obedient to the word of the Lord, the anointing is going to come, and that fat is going to break the yoke that has us bound. Amen? And I thank God for that. I thank him for his word. And I thank you for his promises. Sister Heidi, if you would, let's give them the ways to give tonight. We have Givelify. We also have PayPal available at riverbendpentecostals.com. You can send your cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostals, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. We also have the text to give. This is 833-883-9311. To all of you great people that are in the house tonight, we have the gold pans and the wooden pans. You can put your tithe and offerings here. Now that I'll let you be seated for a little bit, if you'd stand, we're going to go with this prayer, and we're going to say it like we mean it. Amen? Amen. All right. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings, and I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked, the curse is broken, and I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I'm blessed going in. And I'm blessed going out, and all that I do will prosper. In Jesus' name, 
And the church said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Come and give with what God has blessed you with.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. He'll do it, won't he? Yes, he will. First of all, we got to let him. That's the key, Brother Shannon. And I am the world's worst at that. Brother Dave, it seems like my life, if, if I could fix it, I'd try to fix it. But you know what happens when I try to fix it? I mess it all up. And then we bring God, Brother Marcus, the broken pieces. But how much better would our life be if we took it to him first? There's an old song that says, take it to Jesus. Take it to Jesus. If we just done that, we'd be a lot better off. Amen. Thank the Lord for this service. Thank you for each and every one of you that's made it a point to be here. If you'd all be seated. We're going to have all of our babies come up. These River Bend kids and the youth would come up tonight. We're going to pray for them. As they're on their way up here, I just want to tell you a story real quick. My wife was battling some things, going through some sickness here not too long ago. And she ain't testified about it yet. I told her I was going to get her up here to do it, but she chickened out. But uh, young people, you can come too. We're going to pray for all of y'all at the same time tonight. But as y'all's coming, she was going through a lot of things and battling a lot of things and physical things. And thinking about going to the doctor, had been to the doctor, didn't know what was going on. But during the rally that night, she said, I came to church and I told myself, I'm going to be healed tonight. I'm going to get healed tonight. She said, I, if the woman with an issue of blood in the Bible can do it, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, Sister Stephanie, I believe God will heal me. And in the middle of that service, she said she prayed for a few people standing there where she sits. But she said, in the middle of that service, she took two of these babies. One of them was my son, and the other one was little Jackson Lane there. And she said, do you fellas believe that God can use y'all to pray for me? And they both said, yep. And they both put their hands on my wife, and God, through them and through faith, healed her body. And she's not had a lick of trouble with what she had since that night. So I'm here to tell you, it don't have to wait till they get grown. It don't have to wait till they're perfect. God can use a vessel that is willing to be used, amen. All you got to do is be available. And if you're available, God will fill you. If you're available, he'll use you, amen. What a mighty God we serve. I am thankful for the manifold blessings of a living God. I know he's not dead. He ain't in the grave somewhere, but he's alive and well. Amen. And I'm thankful for that tonight. All you grown-ups, if you would, let's stand tonight and turn your hands this way to these children. We're going to pray for them. Because I, I remember, and I know a lot of times in life we get big and we think our problems are the worst problems just because we're the ones going through them. But I remember a time when I was their age and there was problems that were big in their life. And they were big in my life. School was a big one. Life itself is a big one, Brother Blake. But I know God, if he can touch my life, he can touch their life. And I believe God can lead them and guide them and direct them just like he leads and guides and directs me. So let's pray for them tonight that God will have his way and protect them. Lord Jesus, I give you honor and I give you praise, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for your spirit, God, that I feel that's here right now. But God, I give you honor and praise for these children. Your word says, suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for those is the kingdom of heaven. God, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, God. It's the faith that they have to believe, Lord, that when you say it, it's going to come to pass. I pray, God, an anointing upon their life, upon each and every one of these children and young people, God, that you will touch them, that you will strengthen them, that you will encourage them, that you will bless them, that you will help us, O oh Lord, to mentor them, to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Holy Ghost to realize oh God they don't have to wait till they're older but that they have potential right now to be used and blessed by a living God that wants to direct them and use them in their everyday life. I pray an anointing upon them and not only them but their families and their homes oh God that you would protect them. Some of them come into this place God with broken homes some of them come into this place living God a life of hell on earth but I know beyond a shadow 
shadow of a doubt that you can keep them and you can protect them and you can guide them and lead them and their families to a place that is in you, oh God, yea and amen. And I give you praise, I give you honor, and I give you glory. And I pray that you go before them every day of their life. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we ask it. Amen and amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for each and every one of these young people and children that we have here tonight. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. All right, Brother Blake, take them on back. Lane, lead the way, buddy. Young people, y'all just follow in like ducks in a pond right behind them. Y'all can do that, can't you? You got a loop? All right, man. Pastor, he done vamped on me. He's some, oh, he, there he is. <laughs> glory. Do you love Jesus? I believe you do love him. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you for standing. Uh, we did send out a message today asking you if you if you were here last week to bring your hand out back with you. And uh We'll find out how much faith I had that you would do that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're taking notes on it and writing things down on it, you want to bring it back. One of these days, the Lord is going to bless me with the ability to do a Bible study in one week. But it ain't happened yet. I never do plan for it to be more than that, <laughs> but the Lord works in mysterious ways, I guess. But uh, uh, I think we're about got them handed out, maybe. Uh, don't be afraid to raise your hand, even if you're a guest. We're thankful for our guest, aren't we? Amen. Thankful for all of our guests and, and uh, everybody that's here on a Wednesday night. My goodness. Y'all uh, y'all wouldn't believe how many of my friends take what's happening here on Wednesdays as the greatest testimony of revival. Uh, one of my friends who pastors a, a church in the 350, 375 range, he said, if you get 50% of your attendance on Wednesday night, you should consider yourself blessed. That's like the rule of thumb. And we're only about 15 or 20 people different from having the same amount both night, both services. So we, we're knocking on the door of 125, 130 on midweek service every week. And, uh, and I got a long list of absentees tonight who are under the weather or what have you. So thank you for coming on Wednesday nights. And uh, I've been waiting all day to get here. I promise you I have, I, uh, w which we had Thanksgiving Tuesday last week, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and uh, so I, I did by 9.05, I started getting nervous, and y'all was still going strong all the way up till 9.45, so uh, I ain't going to be nervous teaching no more. I ain't never taught till 9.45, ever. Ever. But tonight might be the night. Over the last several weeks, we've discussed. Do we need some more handouts? Okay. Over the last several weeks, we've discussed what it means to have a holy mind. And then after a holy mind come holy communication. And we changed that from holiness of speech because people communicate in so many different ways now, electronic, verbal, etc. And the Bible teaches us, and we've shared with you, that your communication is the outflow of what's in your heart and your mind. Now, we're going to start, we started a couple weeks ago, so we're just going to continue um, to deal with the results of having had first a flawed thinking process, which leads to flawed communication, right? 
Because if I'm not thinking right, I'm not communicating right either. The greatest thing we probably need to flip is everybody who thought they hit it. You hearing me? Everybody who thought they were communicating something different than what was on the inside of them. Impossible. All right? Y'all looked at me like I lost my mind. <laughs> the world is full of it. People who think they're, they think one thing and communicate something else. It doesn't work like that. If it does, the Bible's not true. It shows up. Now, we went to the book of James because we, we learned that it is what comes out of you that defiles you and those that hear you. Those that your communication touches are those who read what you posted on social media. Yeah, y'all going to go with me tonight. We're going to go somewhere. Ain't that right, Brenton? Say amen every now and again, bud, so I know you're with me. That all the rest of and Brother Shannon's been saying amen. Everybody else just don't know if they want to be with me or not. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Feel guilty. I'll take guilty amens all day long. The journey that the book of James led us on, Brother Ronnie's favorite book, by the way, was to embrace our responsibility to hear and do the word. It's our responsibility. It's not your responsibility to preach it, but it is your responsibility to both hear it and then do what it says. That's our responsibility. Okay? It's our responsibility. And... The first and most important aspect of this revelation, James said, is communication, primarily that which is done through our mouth. And what has happened with the advent of all this electronic communication is people get behind a keyboard and get brave. All right? And they think they can just share everything that's on their mind. There ain't no governor on most of us when it comes to the keyboard warrior stuff. All right? But what has happened is everybody dumps everything they think out there, and now we have all got on the don't trust anybody train. All right? And the, the news is preaching it. The world is preaching it. Hollywood is preaching it. Sports figures are preaching it. Everywhere you go, it is division, division, division. Don't trust anybody. Everybody's out to get you. You can't trust the preacher. You can't trust the teacher. You can't trust your mom and daddy. You do know what anarchy is, don't you? Don't trust anybody. Don't listen to anybody. Do your own thing. And that is an ideology that has taken hold in the world because we have now bought into this, this mindset that says, I'm going I'm to have to do it all because you can't trust anybody. That's not true. And we're proving that that's not true, just like what Brother Larry testified about a while ago. We're proving that that's not true, but we've got to continually reiterate it and pound it home and let you know here you're not alone. Whether in, su whether in success or failure, you're going to find somebody to link arms with, uh, to connect with, uh, and to get on the right track with here. Amen? But this downward pull of distrust and disunity and division, the world system has shown its hand in the deterioration of our mental health. Now the purpose of this in every Bible study that we teach is that you don't just leave here inspired. Now we want you to be inspired. But we want you to be inspired to the truth that you can be changed that there's no such thing as hopeless in the kingdom of God. Right. Remember that song they were just singing, all the things that, I, I, I can't get it right because it's kind of like rapping or something, all the things that you would go and undo if you could. <laughs> huh, Y'all didn't know I could beatbox too, did you? You still don't know I can. Okay. 
you got to believe. Hear me. Hear it out on the TV world, out on the Internet world. You've got to believe that when you come into the presence of the Lord, you can be changed from the sole of your feet to the top of your head. Your home, your job, your school, your house, your family, everything can be changed in the presence of the Lord forever. Forever. But we're going to leave you. You've got a handout right there. That's why I... Take them home. Don't put them in the birdcage and, and don't put them in the outhouse, but take them home and write on them and, and grab a hold of them and put them in your Bible and listen to it because I'm putting tools in your hands that will lead you to life change, that you can build your life upon an unmovable, unshakable rock which is accomplished simply by hearing and doing what the Word says. Now, anxious comes from two words, angst and chus, X-I-O-U-S. Angst means a sense of unease. It's like the spider sense, the hair standing up on the back of your neck. You know something's wrong, and the X-I-O-U-S, angst just, is the sound we make when we've ran up a flight of stairs or we've run. How many of you ever had a dog get after you? You, you know what, Brother Ronnie? I, I don't want to digress too much because I want to get done tonight or I really want to get deep into this, but there ain't nothing really funnier than somebody who says I'm a dog person and an old bad dog come out of there and they try to go, here, boy, here, boy, here, boy, and all of a sudden you see their eyes get about that big and they, they, they get re the revelation that they ain't the dog person they thought they were. And when you get to picking them up and putting them down, running from that dog who's just about that far from your backside, that's the feeling right there. That's what just means. So you got unease, but it's doing something to me. It's making my throat close up, and it's making my heart beat fast, and it's making me breathe hard. Max Licato describes it like this. Part chicken little and part Eeyore. The sky is falling, and most of it's falling on me. Fear screams, get out. Anxiety ponders, what if? Fear is when your pulse pounds when you see a rattlesnake in your backyard. Anxiety is when you refuse to ever walk in the backyard again because there might be a snake there. And you also teach your children to not go to the backyard because there might be a snake there. Even though you've lived there 35 years and it was 35 years ago that you saw one. You never know what might happen. Now, the United States is the most anxious nation on the face of the earth. Anxiety disorders are the number one mental health problem among women. I want that to sink in. Stick with me. And they're number two among men with alcohol and drug abuse being number one. Mental health among men and number one among women is anxiety disorders, which I think it's fair to say often leads to substance abuse. Hiding place. At any given time, 50 million people in the United States will feel the effects of any number of anxiety disorders, and that does not include those that they affect. We, know, we do know that every one person that struggles with substance abuse disorder affects five other people. Stress-related ailments cost the United States $300 billion every year. Well, y'all got to stay with me right now. There ain't nothing going on out there more important than what I'm saying right here. If you're visiting and talking, I ain't being ugly. You can do whatever you want to. Y'all are grown. But I'm telling you, this will change your life. Whatever they're saying out there or whatever's on Facebook right now or whoever's texting you right now ain't near as important as what's happening right here. I'm not being ugly, but I'm telling you, your life depends on it.
I can sit up here and I can goof around and I can laugh and I can talk and I can crack jokes and, and all of that's just so you stay connected. But the enemy is not going to let you stay connected without whispering in your ear or pat, patting you on the shoulder or buzzing in your pocket or your pocketbook, whatever the case may be. Now stick with me if you can. In the seven years between 1997 and 2004, Spending on anti-anxiety medication went from $900 million to $2.1 billion, more than doubling. The people of this generation are three times more likely to experience depression than the last generation, and your kids and your grandkids are three times more likely to experience it than you are. The average child today exhibits the same amount of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient of the 1950s. One reason is, is life has got so fast, it has overwhelmed us. We were not created to live as fast as we're living. We're not wired for that, and it's overwhelming. We work around the clock now, just not in the daylight hours, but we work 24 hours a day. We don't eat supper together anymore. We don't eat regular meals together anymore. We just eat when we think we might be hungry. We don't stay at home and entertain ourselves anymore, but we spend millions of dollars per year for somebody else to do it. I believe the last movie I saw made like over $500 million at the box office. That's $500 million worth of two and a half or three hours of being inundated with the very same thing you're inundated with all your life. Sitting shoulder to shoulder with people that are as lost as a goose in a hailstorm. Okay. At the risk of sounding, at the risk of sounding self righteous or judgmental, I don't mind telling you that more times than not, when my family and I get ready to go somewhere, I have to go shut myself in the bathroom for a few minutes or go shut myself in a door somewhere, in a room somewhere, and pray to quench the anxiety that begins to rise up over all of the difficulties we're going to have that day that are not real. Feelings of inferiority, yes, I struggle with them. I was telling Mindy the other day, I know y'all think I'm going to lie, that I'm lying about this, but I, I went to college for two and a half years, and the first two years I raised my hand exactly twice in class because I felt like as soon as a word came out of my mouth, everybody was turning around staring at me. Anybody ever felt that way? Low self-image, irrational anger, chronic fatigue, social anxieties, such as, this is what I tell myself, when you go into this room, don't you say anything or do anything because whatever you say or do is going to be stupid and everybody's going to laugh at you. No one here really wants you to be here anyway, and when you walk into this room, everybody in there is talking about you. Do you realize what anxiety does? It's a tool of the devil that makes me think I'm way more important than I really am. As if everybody in that room ain't got nothing better to talk about than me. Chances are, Brother Ronnie, they didn't even know I was coming. But that's how anxiety works. What if? What if? I'm not a doctor. I'm not an expert in any of these areas, and I will stand flat-footed and tell you Sometimes, if you have heart problems, you go to a heart doctor. If you have belly problems, you go to a belly doctor. If you have eye problems, you go to an eye doctor. If you have ear problems, you go to an ear doctor. And there are times if you have mental difficulties, you need to go to a mental difficulty doctor. Don't you think for one second that I'm telling everybody that hears me that your anxiety is something you can control. I am telling you, most of it is. But I won't have you do it. I won't have you do it. But there are several in the room right now that I have connected with a counselor intentionally. And I will tell you this. If you need medication to find your bearings, I'm for it. 
Hope I didn't just lose everybody right then. Sometimes you don't know where you are. Okay. Don't know. Oh, you take medicine for high blood pressure. You take medicine for gout. You take medicine when you got a toothache, an eye ache, or earache, or a belly ache. I happen to like the Pepto Bismol. It's a true story. All right, give me give me just a second, and then I'll let you. But so I don't want you to think that I'm getting up here and saying that God, He doesn't zap every one of your ailments, but He can lead you to a place where you get it right. I don't know why I felt the need to say that, but I did feel it. And I feel it very strongly. I feel it very strongly. Okay. It doesn't mean you're an outcast. It doesn't mean you're a reject. And it doesn't mean you're defective. But it does mean you better not be looking to a doctor to try to fix something that you won't take any steps to fix yourself. That I'm giving to you right here. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, I just come back to being a saint and dad forever. Yep. Um, that the anxiety definition of that is his fear of us. Yep. And, and you know, it's sexually what I'm thinking has happened to me along with our marriage. Uh huh. And, I'm, and because it happened and because it was negative and traumatic, uh huh. Uh, I live in fear about any, any kind of experience here in heaven or the elements of heaven. Uh huh. For sure, for sure. Uh huh. And that's. <coughs> I'm gonna, I'm thinking about this real quickly, but I'm done thinking about it. That's part of why this is a holiness issue. It's because unchecked, unregulated, undealt with, ignored, or else blamed on somebody else results in a victim mentality. It results in me continuing to live beneath and makes me a sinner. Now, him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. It's, mm, yes, ma'am. You can't stop it from bleeding over in your children. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all very much. You can't stop it because it's in you. It comes out of you. That's what I talked to. Maybe it was Sunday. Maybe it was, I don't know when it was. But this has stuff been flowing for a while. That's why. If I treated y'all like my kids, when y'all showed up for church screaming, I'm a victim, I'd come back there and grab you by the ear and drag you to the bathroom and fix you. I'm serious. Brother Ronnie and, and, and Sister Fran, we fall into that mentality and then sometimes we show up for church for the express purpose of putting us a gang together to feel sorry for us. Yeah, when you come in, sit down, you know, like, don't sit down, plop down, fold your arms, cross your legs, stare off into space with your lips stuck out. It has got a billboard above your head that says something's messed up in my life and I want everybody to know. Yeah. 
Here, here's, you say, what in the world's this got to do with anything? What it's got to do with is there's somebody that come off the street uh, and they come looking for Jesus. Uh, they didn't come looking for your problems. They didn't come looking for your issues. If you got them, if you got them, you need to take them to the Lord, not take them to everybody out here and tell everybody your problems because you've got to be in position to be what somebody needs from the Lord. May I introduce you to the prayer room? You knew you had that problem at 530, at 545. I'm telling you, I stand as a witness to you that I can come in here honorary, go into the prayer room and come out sweet. Oh, Lord, where in the world did I get off on this? My goodness. God is a healer. David was a man who understood God better than perhaps anybody in the Old Testament. God was searching for somebody that was after his own heart. And he said, I found him in David. And in Psalm 103, 1 through 4, David said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why would I forget what the Lord had done for me? Why would I be in danger of forgetting what God had done for me? What's that? I got distracted. Well, who said that? Anxious. I got anxious, and I forgot that he brought me through everything I've ever come through, and I decided he ain't going to bring me through this. And that's why I forgot. That's a good, that's a good point as well. But David said, I will bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits. Now, this is exciting, but I'm going to move through it real quickly because I've got to get to the next part. But this word benefits is benefits to me or for me according to his perfect will. And his benefits do not regard my preferences to be benefits. That means the benefits of God, sometimes I like them and sometimes I don't like them, but they're still benefits to me. Oh, and that's what I'm praising him for. Just like we talked about before church, Andy, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers because sometimes he doesn't do what I want because it ain't right for me. And looking back, I have to know that's what that forgetting is. Sometimes, Brother Ronnie, he is the greatest blessing to me in doing absolutely nothing for me. Okay. Look here. Here's what his benefits are. Verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Stop believing, feeling, Holy Ghost, help me right now. Stop holding on to the lie that you've done things that God can't forgive. Stop. That's one of the greatest motivators and fuels for our anxiety is we feel like we're the worst human that's ever lived and that we've sinned and God can't forgive us. If the word of God is true, it says he forgives all thine iniquities. And healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. He offers hope and restoration. Well, here's what that word, that verse might say. Who's the God of recovery? Who crowneth thee 
with loving kindness and tender mercies. That word crowneth, I looked it up, and it means surrounds you. So he surrounds us with loving kindness and tender mercies. That's the God we serve. What's the first thing the devil does when he starts trying to mess with you? Tries to skew your view of who God is. Now, Christians are probably more prone to developing high levels of stress, which is a primary source of anxiety, in a large part due because we feel a constant pressure to be good. Live good lives, treat people good, be good providers. But the problem is, is we're relying upon our own abilities to do that rather than the Spirit to work through us and do it. And too often when we're working in the flesh, we find ourselves falling short because we're not good enough by ourselves. And so we work and we work and we work and we work and we try and we work and we try and we work and we try and we work and getting harder and harder to get in line. But then we find out we can't ever get in line. So we just throw our hands up and be bad. We just give up. The harder we try, the more frustrated we become because self-reliance will always be futile. It'll always be not good enough. And we find ourselves spiritually and physically exhausted, depleted. We got nothing left, but we keep trying. And we try harder with less to work with which leads to a repeated cycle, but the margin for error gets shorter and shorter. And ladies and gentlemen, this is not the will of God. It's not the will of God. I'm going to say this right now, and God have mercy if I'm wrong that I apologize up front. But one thing we've got to stop doing is getting together and celebrating us being messed up and celebrate us being anxious and celebrate us being flawed and celebrate us being wrong and start rejoicing in the Lord who is our solution, who is our help, and who is our hope. Edify one another and build one another up. Don't come together celebrating because you're messed up. Misery does love company, but misery's got to be put out of business in the church. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. We're supposed to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. That's not an indictment against us unless we choose to stay like we are. And if we're going to stay like we are, it's because we chose to. Uh huh. Okay. I wasn't even going to say that tonight. <laughs> I have tried my best to be as sweet and nice and not be blunt. And then Sister Stacy went and ruined everything. That could not be any more true. It's arrogance. It is arrogance to believe that you could be bad enough to make the blood not effective. If you're saying that I... I'm just repeating what Sister Stacy said, so don't get mad at me. But if you're going around standing on the platform behind the pulpit preaching that you've just been too bad... You just ain't ready to be good yet. Ain't that what you just said, kind of? It must have been the Lord wanting it because I was feeling it about five or ten minutes ago and I didn't say it, so please forgive me. Thank God it was somebody else. Yes, ma'am.
That's why we're preaching that message right now. That's. But how in the world could we continue to let people feel that way when we know that's a lie? That's, but you're right. But there's a whole world that feels that way. I, I, listen, the devil will try to make me feel that way. You know, he's going to mess with me. I'm just telling y'all, he's going to mess with me tonight. Yeah, yeah, but I, I might argue that it found you. When you got connected with people that knew the truth, which is was God loves you, and then you believed it because you found out, you know what? I ain't the most messed up person around here. There's people all around me that have been in the gutter. They know what I've done. They know where I've been with. Matter of fact, matter of fact, there's some of these people make me proud to be here because I ain't as bad as I thought I was. Right? Let's do Marcus and then we'll get this. There's a difference in being anxious and having anxiety. Having anxiety is a control problem. Being anxious is an expectation problem that's full of faith. But at the end of the day, being anxious about it, the reason why that I, that I look around and the reason why I get scared and the reason why, because I feel powerless. But the expectation of going to a ball game or, the, you know, or, or of coming to the house of God, I felt that all day long. But if I could have controlled it, I'd have called all of y'all and said church started at 1 o'clock today. <laughs> you see, there's a difference. What we're talking about is a desire to be in control of everything. Yeah. And because I think I can't control anything. Yeah. Oh, no. 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 He was... In reality, dealing with the truth of he knew what he had to do. He had to do it, but the flesh didn't want to. He would have been out of his mind if he had wanted to in the flesh. That's why he told his disciples, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. So please understand, this is not, I don't want to be too transparent because y'all might kick me out, fire me. But until you've walked the floor all night long for five, six, seven hours, sick at your stomach over something that you think might happen, I am not, I can't tell you, I can't tell you what it's like. Y'all don't make fun of me. They make fun of me because I told them I got contact high one time and I think I'm an expert. <laughs> I can't tell you about getting drunk. I can't tell you about getting high. I can't tell you about shooting up. I can't tell you about being, not even knowing where you're at. But I can tell you about being led into the valley of the shadow of death in the spirit. I can be tell you about, oh man. I'm, I'm not going to say no more. I'm going to move on. We're going to let Des talk. I've been here before, Brother Cody. Praying in an empty church. Right there at that altar. And that anxiety hit me. And I jumped up and ran out of here and got in my truck, scared out of my mind over something that was born in my mind. So 
I am not sitting on a high horse looking down at people that struggle. When it comes to teaching this, I'm with you. All right, Des. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you keep saying I was this and I was this and I was this. Thank God. That's that's how a lot of us can say this is what I was. But God, but God stepped in, and that's why, friend, just like Des is saying, that's what we're trying to loose people into. Let me tell you. Oh man. I should maybe let Jen talk because I'm about to cause trouble <laughs> in a good way. There are people in here that what I'm teaching about as far as on the hope side is foreign because you are incomplete. Even if God has delivered you, you are incomplete if all you've been doing is taking it in. The ones that are living, the people in this church that are living overcoming lives are the ones that have become conduits rather than cisterns. And they take in, but then they give out. And they're teaching Bible studies. Uh, and they're going to recovery meetings. Uh, and they're going to be counselors at this place or the other. It's not good enough uh, to say I felt the power of God if you have not allowed somebody else to feel it through you. And I would argue that the devil's greatest victory of anxiety warfare is making people scared to share Jesus Christ. And I guess maybe in the Holy Ghost right now, the purpose for this very lesson and the things that are being said in this room tonight is to deliver the revelation that the world really does want what you have, that the world really does need what you have. And when they stick a pipe in their mouth or a needle in their arm or hop in bed with somebody, they're looking for Jesus. They're looking for help. They're looking for hope. They're looking for salvation. And we got there has to be a change. 
Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Esther was a little Jew girl who won a beauty contest and became queen. It's a true story. But she was a Jew, and the authorities, the powers that be that were connected to the people hated the Jews. The king loved them. He didn't have a problem with them, but the, the, the guy, vice president hated them. And so he began to build a gallows upon which he was going to kill all the Jews. And the king agreed to it because he was deceived into it. But Esther was in the palace. And she was positioned to make a difference in her world. And her uncle Mordecai came to her. And Brother Larry, I believe with all of my heart, she thought she was safe in the palace. She didn't want Mordecai out there in sackcloth and ashes and repenting and crying and, and praying and travailing. She tried to put a worldly garment on him. And he refused it. And he sent a messenger to her and said, if you hold your peace, knowing what you know, and in a position that you're positioned in, then shall their enlargement and deliverance now, enlargement, just in case you was wondering, kind of means get fat and break the yoke. For those of you that don't know what that's talking about, watch Sunday's sermon. Enlargement and deliverance. Getting out from under the pressure, Des, that's what enlargement means. Deliverance will arise to the Jews from another place. Please hear me in the Holy Ghost right now. There's going to be revival in southeast Missouri. And there's going to be a multitude of people. That God is going to bring and fill with his spirit. And is going to be baptized in Jesus' name. And going to be delivered into walking a life of holiness. It's coming. He said, enlargement and deliverance will arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. If we're not making a difference in our world, what use do we have being here? And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Do you realize Sister Sheila, that if this, if that revelation right there, if we're going to, man, if we're going to be anxious and if we're going to worry and if we're going to stress about something and we're going to think about possibilities, why not it be, who knows? Maybe this is the very reason I'm here. Who knows? Huh? Who knows? Maybe. Maybe. There was a reason why I got a job at Walmart. There was a reason why Larry came by and I thought he was a cutie pie. There was a reason. I, 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 I declare unto you right now that there's never been anything in your life that was by happenstance. Uh, but I believe with all of my heart uh, that everything that has happened in your life uh, happened uh, to bring you to this moment uh, in this church uh, right now. But you did not come. I like having a full house. I like all of you being here. And I'm going to tell you, it makes me Holy Ghost proud when my wife tells me we had 145 Sunday. We had 155 Sunday. We had 135 Wednesday. It makes me Holy Ghost proud. But I got delivered from feeling like I arrived because your rump is in that seat. I'm... I will not feel like I've arrived till your rump is set next to another rump that you brought to the house of God. Oh. 
Mordecai reminded Esther of her divine purpose in being part of a divine solution in bringing deliverance to her people. Brother Derek, you're right in saying I don't like the word fixed. We are not fixing what was broke. That's not what the Lord does. The Lord makes it new. Now, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That is a new creation. That's what it means to be born again. We have got to stop giving people an excuse, Sister Stacy, just like you said, and we've got to stop validating those excuses. Uh, when you get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, uh, you have been positioned uh, to be used by God uh, and to be a fully functioning part of the body. First Peter 2 and 9, but you are a chosen generation. A chosen generation. You were designed, G.L. King was designed to be born March the 22nd, 1973. That's when I was designed to be here. For this moment. A chosen generation. You were not born out of time. You were not born in the wrong place to the wrong family with the wrong bank account or the wrong last name. God brought you into this world and he is empowering you to be everything he created you to be. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That does not mean weird. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. You know what that peculiar means? That means that there ain't nobody like you in the whole wide world specifically created for him. That he made you perfect. He made you unique. He made you powerful. He made you peculiar. Meaning, look at your fingerprints. Uh, scientists will tell you that nobody, 8 billion people in the world, nobody has your same fingerprints. Uh, nobody has your same voice print. Uh, you are a unique human being made especially for the work of the Lord. Now y'all got to believe this stuff. You've got to believe it. It's the word of God. But you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's clearly establishing that the time in which we live is where we're supposed to live. And it's here. This is our time. I ain't done this in a long time, but... In case y'all was wondering, Christmas morning, we having church. Oh, there wasn't that many clapping. I'm like, Ooh. 11 o'clock, no elements class. 11 o'clock, we're having church. You do know it's Christmas. We're going to be having church, and I'm working on my, I about got it. Matter of fact, I'm going to have to weed it down a little bit. I done been working on what I'm going to preach, but it ties in right exactly with this. Whoo, Lord Jesus. It's going to get frustrating when the Lord doesn't show up when you want him to or you think you need him to. Unless we be discouraged as to the delaying of the Lord's coming, in light of the task ahead. See, these people that Jesus was speaking to wanted him to get on the throne right there so they could be elevated. But Jesus didn't come to elevate, he came to serve. He humbled himself. We're going to talk about that in Elements Sunday morning. We have been given 
an investment and an obligation. God has invested in you and I an eternal investment. And we have a responsibility. Well, I got another message, but I ain't going to preach it right now. But we have a responsibility to live up to what he created us for. And I'm going to be back to Sister Stacy's comment. That's why it would be a sin for us to keep letting people wallow around in that mud hole of justification and stay like you are when God is waiting to loose you into what you can become. And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds, Luke 19 and 13, and said unto them, Occupy. Everybody say that word. Occupy until I come. Oh, Lord. The word occupy simply means this. And I'm going to cover one more passage. And then we're going to, I'm going to save the rest till next week. As if you were surprised. Occupy. You know what it means? Carry on the business of Jesus until he comes. Occupied means that in that particular area, you're in charge. In that particular area, you are in charge. Occupy, hold the fort, keep it busy, keep it going until I come. Verse 26 of John 14, but the comforter. Here we go, Brother Marcus. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's why we need the Holy Ghost. It's not so you can join the club. It is so that Jesus Christ can begin to work in you. He'll teach you what you need to know. He'll bring all things to your remembrance that you need to remember. Whatsoever Jesus taught will come back. Brother Skipper, we've talked about that several times. You can read it, and then six months later, the Lord will quicken it to your mind in a discussion. I can't wait till that happens to you, Brenton. I have faith you're going to show up and tell everybody because I'm apostolic, baby. We're talking about overcoming anxiety. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. And here's the most important word in this chapter. My peace. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Please hear me when I tell you. You will not find what you're looking for in the world. They can't give it to you. It doesn't exist out there. You will not find it in your political party getting elected to office. Y'all get on Facebook all you want to and brag about being a Democrat or being a Republican. That don't mean beans from Shinola when it comes to the peace of God. I see that nonsense. I got to put, look to the one who's in charge. I started reading something today that was scaring me a little bit about the economy. I done lived through one recession. 2008, I didn't know nothing happened. True story. I didn't know nothing happened. Didn't nothing change for us. You know what, Brenton? The promises of God aren't subject to the economy. Wall Street ain't got nothing on Jerusalem Street. Huh? It, we cannot be worried about stuff that we can't control. 
But I can make sure, Sister Fran, that I don't ever meet another human being that doesn't know Jesus loves them wherever they are, whatever they've done, and however they did it, and whoever they did it with. Look here. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Look at here. So the peace of Jesus Christ, what is it? Here's what it was. He knew who he was. He knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going, and he knew where his validation came from. He knew that there was not a living human being that had the power to nullify the will and purpose of God for his life. That's the peace of God. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. What is troubled? Here's what troubled is. Agitated, shaky, unsettled, moving rapidly. Afraid, fearful, shrinking, or cowardly. I'm quitting. I heard you yawn. That's my sign to go. Stand with me. Here's the biggest trouble we're going to have out of this lesson today. I'm going to come back to Sister Stacy's comments because I probably cut her off before she went as far as she could go with that. Because if you need an excuse, you don't have to look far to find one. But here's all you got to do. Believe the word and believe it's for you. And believe that God will do what he says he'll do. That's it. Believe the word. If he don't come through me for, for me today, you know what, Brother Brenton? He will tomorrow. I can't control none of this anyway. I want to be holy. I don't want to be a worry wart. And I got them tendencies. I got them tendencies to say, what if, what if, what if? But you know something, Sister Dana? I'm winning that battle. I'm winning that battle. Brother Shannon, it ain't happening near as often as it was because you know what I decided? Don't want to be that way no more. I want to be holy in my mind. I want to trust God. I want to have faith in God. That, he, that his words are in him, Brother Larry, yay and amen. I want to believe that. You don't want to miss next Wednesday. If you do, you won't get the conclusion. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Let's pray. God, we love you. We adore you. We believe in you and the power of your word. I know, God, that these things that I worry about, they're distractions. All they are is getting in the way of me hearing your voice. Uh, I pray, God, that we realize that we're not damning or condemning anybody. We're not talking down to anybody, but we're all in this fight together, and this is the body of Christ, and, and we want to win, and we want to get better, and we want to overcome, and we want to have the wisdom that comes from heaven. We want to be, be able to operate and live from heaven's point of view, not from a carnal point of view. Uh, we got to know where we came from, and we got to know where we're going, and we got to know that our validation is in you, Lord, not in anybody else, but it's in you. It's you that we will stand before and hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Bring us there, Lord. Bring us to that place where we achieve maximum effectiveness in the kingdom of God without being distracted by what ifs. Thank you for coming tonight, Sunday morning at 10, Elements class. It's great. Levin's worship. We love you. God bless you. There's some things to sign up for the ladies on the back table. Take a look at it. You're dismissed.